Father, I thank you that we can, we can come here and we can worship, that we can uh, see artists that love you, these, these individuals that are, are up here playing because you have changed their life and they are using their gifts for you. Thank you that we can come here, that we can sing these songs, that we can read the words, we can hear what the person standing next to us is proclaiming with their voice and be reminded of your glory, be reminded of your grace, be reminded of the fact that we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to come here having our lives all together. We don't stand here saying that we are good before you because of what we have done, but we can stand here today saying we are good before you because of what Christ has done. Father, thank you that we have a message of grace. We have a message of mercy. We have a message of peace. Father, I pray now as we look at your word, as we turn once again to the book of Exodus, as we get to see your redemptive story played out long before Christ ever came to earth, and yet the story of redemption was, was ever present. Lord, help us to see your grace and mercy and truth. Be with me this morning in my words to be clear and help us to just walk away from here as always better glorying in you and your gospel. In your name, amen. Well, you can turn to Exodus chapter 21. We are going to actually jump into the book of the covenant this morning. We introed it, if you will, last week. But last week I said that there's three questions, three main questions that we, we really have to look at before we jump into the book of the covenant. The first one was how the laws fit together in the greater story of redemption. That's ultimately what we looked at last week was a description of how in the world does Exodus 21, 22, 23 fit within the larger story of redemption. And what we saw was is that all the way back in Eden before uh, sin entered the world, man's purpose was to worship God. Man's purpose was was to spread out and to push his glory throughout the earth. And now that our lives have been reconciled to God, now that Israel once again has a relationship with Yahweh, now that they can once again interact with him, they are returning to that original purpose of being priests of God and spreading the worship and honor of glory of him throughout the earth. Well, this week, I want to start by answering the last two introductory questions that I posed, and then we're going to look at our first section, the first um, topic in this book of the covenant. The first question that I want to look at is, why do these particular laws matter to us? Why should we even spend the time to study them? And the second one is, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a technical one, but it's an important one. It's how should we understand the timing of these laws when were they actually written? So the first one, why do these particular laws matter to us? Look at Exodus 21, 28 through 29. I think this will be a good illustration of why I asked this question. When an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten. But if the owner of the ox, but the owner of the ox shall not be liable. But if the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past and its owner has been warned but has not kept it in and it kills a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned and the, o- and the owner also shall be put to death. So my first question for us this morning is who owns an ox? Huh? Who's, who, how, how, how can we actually apply this? What is the point of these laws? You see, it's a reasonable question to ask because um, the, the details that we're going to read in the book of the covenant don't necessarily directly apply to us. Like the topic we're going to look at today is slaves and slavery. Slavery, luckily for us, is not a thing. I'm not talking to slave owners this morning. There's a lot of uh, laws in here about livestock of oxen. Probably most of you, maybe, maybe, you know, here or there, some of you own some form of livestock, a a cow or a goat or something like that. But but on the whole, we don't live in a agricultural livestock community where these things directly apply. So how are we to look at these laws and how are we to apply these laws? Well, I think this is a good opportunity to make this point. The Ten Commandments are valid and are appropriate regardless of time and culture. You see, the time and culture of Israel, these examples that we're going to look at over the next couple of weeks, are very different than our time and culture. How they lived is very different from how we lived. 
But regardless if you're walking in a desert, regardless if you're establishing a home in a foreign country, or regardless if you live in Nashville, Tennessee in the year 2020, God's law, God's Ten Commandments, God's commands for how his creatures should live are valid and they apply to you. But the struggle that we have is to see how, how those laws apply to us. And the struggle for us, I would say for us, is to see how Christ and Christianity not only work in the American culture and in the moral culture that we have here, but to see that God's laws are not limited to just our culture. You see, the Ten Commandments, th- those are transcultural, those are countercultural, those, those can exist in time and space, regardless of the language you speak, where you grew up, how you grew up, when you grew up, God's law is valid. I actually, I, I love studying how we can relate to God. I love studying the topic of, if you will, Christ and culture. I've, I've read several books on it. I've actually spoken on it a couple of times, both in our adult Sunday school class and when I was a student ministries pastor here in student ministries. Because I, I, I've, obviously the word of God, the, the, the gospel of Christ, is something that applies to us every single day. It's not something that we just do, we just talk about here at church. And so that idea of how is it that the gospel relates to our daily lives, it's, it's always, it, it's always uh, struck me as interesting. I've always tried to work it out in my own mind. Well, a couple of years ago when I was the student ministries pastor here at Fall Retreat, I was speaking on Christ and culture at our Fall Retreat. I was describing to our students, here's this relationship that that you're going to have because you're a Christian or because you uh, want to follow Christ. This is how that is going to relate to the world around you. This This is the intersection between Christ and culture. I had like four messages on this thing. Then at the very end, one of our youth leaders walks up to me. This youth leader is not, was originally not from America. He was, he was an international student. And he walks up to me and he very graciously says, Ryan, those are great messages, but those are worthless to anyone outside of the U.S. You have so confused your Christianity with your Americanity, as people have coined it, that you have confused everything. That message does nothing if you are in a foreign country. And what I realized was is that I so easily entangled what being a good Christian was, what being a God honoring, what, what living a God honoring life was like with, by, with, with applying it to just myself and just my own culture. But what we're going to get to do over the next couple of weeks as we look at the book of the covenant is realize that God's laws are valid regardless of time and space. And in order for, and and the answer for us of what makes us a good Christian, what makes us live a God honoring life, how is it that we can honor God with our lives? The answer to that cannot be something that only fits within the Christian culture or sorry, it only fits within the American culture. It has to be something that, is, that can apply across time and space. And so as we look at these laws in 21, 22, and 23, what we're going to do is we're going to look at not, uh, not apply directly these laws of like, well, if I don't have an ox, then I can, you know, just uh, throw that law out the window. But what we're going to see, what we're going to try to look at is the thing beneath the thing. Why was this law established and given to Israel on this journey? And so the way that we're going to apply these is not just directly, oh, well, I'm going to take this and apply it to my life, but rather we're going to see why these laws were written. Second thing, we need to understand before we jump into this, the timing of these laws. As I said, this is a technical question, but I think one that uh, maybe some of you might be asking you know, along this journey, I have said that Moses is the primary author of Exodus, and he is the primary author of Exodus. He's the primary author of, of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. He's the guy who wrote it down. But when we come to, law, to sections like this, it, 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 there's an issue. Because this, the, the application here, the laws here, apply not to the time that Israel is in. They apply not to a, a people that's walking through a desert. They apply not to a people that doesn't have a homeland. But rather, it, it applies to people living an established life. 
It applies to people who have oxen. It applies to, to situations that have not yet uh, 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 been, been brought up in Israel's life. And so the question is, people have asked, well, because Exodus 21, 22, and 23 exist, maybe Moses didn't write these words. You see, in this section, we're going to read about sanctuary cities. This is actually going to be next week. But if somebody kills a man and it's an accident, he can flee to one of these sanctuary cities and he can find um, safety there. Well, here in Exodus 21, we haven't learned about sanctuary cities yet. We haven't seen those established. Those sanctuary cities haven't been, haven't been put into place. So people have said, wait. If you say that Moses is the author of these things and Moses is writing chapter 21, Moses didn't know about these sanctuary cities yet. So the question that is then brought up is, what is the timing of these laws being written? So I want to just give a greater explanation of who wrote Exodus, who wrote the Torah, if you will. Moses was the primary author Moses was the individual interacting with God. But Moses was not the only person that God used to tell us this story. You see, Deuteronomy 34 recounts Moses' death. It would be physically impossible for Moses to write Deuteronomy 34 because Moses didn't know how Deuteronomy 34, that Moses didn't know how he were to die. And again, people have used this to undermine the work and the sovereignty of God and, 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 the, and the credibility of this book. But what rather is going on here is that Moses did personally pen these words. Moses did live these things. Moses did hear these details. But God used other people to compile all of these things to give them to us. God used other people, if you will, to edit this book and say this is going to be the best way to offer this story to us for us to read today. So now the question I want to answer is why does Exodus 21, 22, and 23, why is it placed directly after the Ten Commandments? Why is it that details that could not be known here, why are they placed in this part of the story? And here's the answer. Because God knew that the moment that you read the Ten Commandments, the moment that you came in contact with these details, the first question you were going to ask was, what does that look like in everyday life? How should I apply those things? That's great, but what does that look like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? And in God's sovereignty, he had, when these books were compiled and were presented to us, he had the book of the covenant placed directly after the giving of the Ten Commandments so that Israel and that you and I today could see that the Ten Commandments that God's law is valid regardless in time and space, and God's law is valid in everyday life. So with that being said, what, what I want to do as, as, as we move forward in this, my, my goal is not to look at this verse by verse. My goal is not to exegete every given detail here. As I said, um, we can't apply the direct words. We have to apply the, the, the heart of the matter and the heart of, of these laws and so, I want to look at this in big sections. I'm not going to hit every verse. And we're going to go in, in, in by, 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 uh, by topical sections here. And so, the first section that we are going to look at today is slavery. Exodus 21. Now, I want to read it. I want to read what the text says. And then I've got some footnotes, if you will, before we jump into this text. Now, these are the rules that you set before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. For if he, co if he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him a son or daughters, the wife and the children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. But if the, if the slave plainly says, I love my master and my wife and my children, I will not go out free, then the master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and the master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and, shall, and he shall be his slave forever. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, he shall go out as a, as a male slave 
as male slaves do. She does, if she does not please her master, who has designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people, since he has broken faith with her. If he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her as a daughter. If he takes another wife for himself, he shall not diminish her food or clothing or marital rights. If he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. First thing that I have to say this morning is that the Bible obviously references slavery. But while the Bible references slavery, it does not praise slavery. It does not approve of slavery. It does not suggest that we should have slaves, but it does acknowledge it. I just have to admit, in this time, in our nation's time, in the, in the, in the current cultural debates that we're having, this is a... Um, ironic text to be teaching like let's just be honest we were supposed to get to this back in March but the fact that COVID happened and and, and then the fact that our country has been um, you know has been thrust into these debates on racism this is a ironic text to be preaching on here and now and yet it's in scripture and where I want to start, these are the footnotes that, that I want to offer, is that there are several types of slavery that, are, are being, that have been uh, uh, used throughout time. The first one has more in common with the language of employment. That's ultimately what's happening here. The first one, a slave does not give up personal rights in status as a person. The slave is a person who has been asked to do a job, and at the end of whatever that employment term is here, seven years, then that person goes free, but that person is viewed as a person. But the second type of slavery, that slave, that person loses all personhood and is viewed simply as an item and is used up and disposed. Honestly, that's the slavery that America has as the stain on our history. And, and honestly, the, the sin of the American church is that for hundreds of years, we stood by and allowed that to happen in our midst. The sin of the American church is that we wrongly applied passages like this and said, oh, the Bible speaks about slavery so I can turn a blind eye to slavery. The Bible speaks about slavery. The Bible recognizes that, that there's slavery. It acknowledges its existence, but it never says it's a good thing. Rather, what it says is, if you must do that, sinner, here is how you should best operate. If you are going to do that, here is what you must recognize, which is ultimately what, this, what we have before us in this text this morning. Here's a few thoughts in this particular section, though. It would stand out to the Israelites that in the book of the covenant, the very first subject is slavery. Just consider who the Israelites were. Slaves. They knew the harshness of slavery. It's also ironic because normally in these, in these type of books, in these laws, when, when details are given, we, we, we have other uh, uh, manuscripts like this from other cultures where they're dealing with just kind of the culture of, of that land. And normally in those places, slaves are the last to be dealt with. It's, it's, it's like the after, it's like, uh, oh yeah, and here's how you should handle your slaves. But the fact that the very first thing in this book of the covenant is dealing with slavery would not be missed by Israel. They would also see the heart and the mindset behind these laws as well. And they would be comparing the words that they saw on the page in front of them, or rather what they were hearing from Moses. They would, they would be comparing with what, they, what they heard from Moses with how they were treated with the Egyptians. They would understand the intent behind these commands. Now I said there's two types of slavery. One is closer to employment. One is an abomination of, of man of assuming that we're taking away personhood. With this type of slavery here, it was actually common among the ancient nations. It was common among the ancient nations because slavery at a time was used to better your life. You see, there were different types of slaves. There were different reasons for people to be enslaved. The first one was to pay off a debt. 
I have a debt to you that I cannot possibly pay you back. I will become your slave for X period of time. And at the end of that, my debt is going to be paid off. Others became slaves because it would establish security in their life. And they would look at it and go, I would be better off if this person protected me, and so I am going to be their slave. Others were born into it. As we could see here, if, if a man and is given a wife and they has children, the children are the slave masters. Now, some people, in the case of Israel, were captured in war and became slaves. And so, the cruelty of slavery is not new. It is not found just in our American history. That cruelty of slavery is there. But then there's this last um, group of slaves. They're the bond servants, as we know them. An individual who was given, who was working and was given to another person and at the end of his tenure there said, you know what, I love you so much. I love this life. I love my wife. I will become your slave for life. I will become a bond servant. And he decided to stay there. You see, this, this passage, it's interesting about this passage, the difficulty about this passage, where the American church has gotten passages like this wrong, is that it almost seems like the slave and master relationship could go well. It almost seems like, oh, that's no big deal. It's just a guy becoming a slave. Yet rarely in life do things go well. Rarely in life do we see relationships, slave and the master relationship going well. And yet, what God, what Moses is, is now declaring to the Israelites is, listen, if you are going to have slaves, this is how you need to uh, go into that endeavor. This is how you need to think about it. This is how you need to apply it. This is what needs to change. See, I said the Bible does not approve or endorse slavery, but it does offer the proper perspective of it. Let's ask this question. Why do you enslave a person? Why would you enslave a person? I think the answer is as simple as this. Because you think you're better than them. For whatever reason, you think you're better than them. Why did Joseph's brothers enslave Joseph? Joseph. Because they saw him as less than. They were jealous of him. They thought they were better than them. Why did Pharaoh enslave a whole nation? Because he viewed Israel as lower than Egypt. Egypt was better than them. In our own history, why did slavery flourish? Because we believed that people with a, that who were different than us, as simple as skin color, were less than us. And we were better than them. That better than, greater than, more important than uh, mentality, it still exists today. But it does not exist in this passage here. You see, slavery here is between brothers. Slavery here is between equal people, people with equal personhood. Um, later on in, in the Torah, in Deuteronomy fifteen twelve, it says this, If your brother, a Hebrew man or woman, is sold to you. He shall serve you six years. In the seventh year, you shall let him go for free. A slave in this section, as we looked at, had to be treated with the same respect as your fellow countryman and, fa and family member. I mean, even consider once again, as he goes, if you take another wife, you shall not diminish her food, her clothing, her marital rights. And if you do these three things, well, then she can leave you without payment of money. Look in 21, 26 through 27. This is talking about a slave as well as anyone else. If a man strikes the eye of his slave, male or female, and destroys it, he shall let the slave go for free because of the eye. If he knocks out the tooth of his slave, male or female, he should let the slave go free because of the tooth. If you were the master of somebody, if you had a slave, it was your obligation to protect them. It was your obligation to make sure they were safe. It was your obligation to make sure that they had just as many uh, uh, rights and privileges and protection as you did and your family members did. One of the rabbis, when, when they were talking about this text, it says this. Here's how they observed all of this. 
Here's, here's one of the sayings they had. He who buys a Hebrew slave is like one buying himself a master. He who buys his Hebrew slave is like one who buying himself a master. In Deuteronomy 15 again, at the end of seven years, when a slave goes out or after you have hurt one of your slaves and knocked out a tooth or knocked out an eye, I mean, just consider how easy that is to knock out a tooth. Like I had a tooth knocked out in college because of playing water polo with my professor. Like knocking out a tooth is easy, I'm sorry. Then all of a sudden it's like, oh, he, he, he can go free. But when he goes out, the master is to give a portion of his livestock to the slave. When the, when the slave departs the master, the master is to set the slave up for success, is to give a portion of their wealth to this individual. Why? Because when a, when a slave goes out of a master's home, the understanding there is the slave is just as important, has the same personhood and value as the master himself. You know, I can't help but think of Jesus' synopsis of the law of the Ten Commandments when I think of this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. The way that you could apply that here is, and love your slave as yourself. As yourself. You know, in man's economy, it is very easy to think that we're better than somebody else. Comparison reigns. You drive down the street, And as passing cars, you go, man, I wonder what they do to drive that car. And I wonder what they don't do because they drive that car. I wonder how they got that house. And I wonder why they're in that place. I wonder what happened to them that made them uh, have this life decision. And I wonder what happened over here. Comparison reigns. The fact of the matter is, is that we all drag around our personal prejudices. All of us have them. All of us. And if you come up to me after this and go, I'm not prejudiced of anyone, give me time, I'll find it. It's the thing we all struggle with. We all think that we're better than. We are filled with personal pride and we look down upon someone for having something. And in our minds, that's either undesirable or in in a position that we would tell ourselves, I would never end up that way. You know, it's the same trait that fills us with self-pride when we are reminded that, you know what, there's a person out there that I don't want to be. And it's that prejudice that drives this idea of, uh, of, of, better than, of better than and drives this idea of judgmentalism. You see, in man's economy, we are constantly enslaving others in our hearts, placing them under the iron fist of our judgment. We may not personally enslave people. We may not... Tell somebody, you have to do this. We may not own a slave, but I, I will tell you that we judge others around us the same way that slave masters judge their slaves. You see, we may not place them in chains and strike them with whips, but we definitely place them under our self-righteous judgment and rule. Physically, as slaves uh, that existed in this country, they've ceased. But ultimately, the judgmentalism that allowed that slavery to be possible has not ceased. Now, this idea that all of us have this prejudice that we have to deal with, we, we, we want to fight against that. We struggle with that. That's an offensive reality. I recognize when I stand up here and go, we all struggle with the same judgmentalism that allowed slavery to reign. We go, no, we don't. But that's just... It's there. And I think we can see it best when we, when we compare man's economy with God's economy. In God's economy, there's only one judge, and it's God. And he judges everyone equally. In God's economy, all of mankind, all of his creatures are equal in personhood. All of his creatures, all of his persons have equal value. All of his creatures are, and all of his persons are made in his image. Full stop. Judgmentalism can exist when we can look at somebody else and go, I am better than you because of blank. But when God judges us, it is, it is total and it is complete in saying, listen, I'm judging all of you because you are all sinners. You all are uh, damned hell. You all need my grace. When God judges us, there is no better than. It is we are all at the mercy of God. But the 
beautiful thing of God's economy is that when he saves his church, when he saves his people, likewise, those outward human traits that we so judge ourselves with, they cease to exist. Consider again Galatians 3 that Devin read. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither, there is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. When Paul wrote this statement to the Galatians, he was writing to a church that was trying to prove that one group of people were better than the next. And this one group of people that that were better than, well, well, because I have Jewish blood in me, I am better than my Gentile brother. Well, because I have been circumcised, I am better than my uncircumcised brother. Well, because I have done the right things, I am better than those who have done the wrong things. And yet when Paul writes this statement that quite frankly was shocking I'm sure some people fell over backwards at it there's neither Jew nor Greek slave nor free male nor female but all are one in Christ what basically it was saying was you guys are all in the same boat there is no better than man's economy is garbage it is whether you have the love and grace of Christ or you do not here's what that means for our time and space here today. In our world that is filled with judgmentalism over whether you are voting for the correct political party or whether you have the correct view of, let's say, capitalism or socialism, whether you uh, have made the correct life choices, whether you have the correct skin color, what that means for all of those, those thoughts of judgmentalism that we so love to judge each other by is that they are all garbage. In God's economy, when you walk in the church, and I don't mean just this building, but I mean in the church, in God's economy, all of that goes away. None of that matters. The sin of the church was that we turned a blind eye to judgmentalism. The sin of the church was that we allowed, of the American church, was that we allowed for just this hatred to reign. What the church needs to be known for is a place where it's, we are not going to judge. We are not going to allow for this hatred to reign, but rather we are going to remind you that every single person regardless of skin color or any other difference you want to pick pick out regardless is the same in the light of God a sinner in need of grace and in need of Christ as we turn towards the communion table I just want to remind you all of the story of 1 Corinthians the issue of 1 Corinthians was it was better than judgmentalism again reigned. And when the church was gathering together, it was gathering together to take communion. And the masters, the wealthy, those who may not have had to consider becoming a slave in order to have personal security in life, they would get to church first. They would gorge themselves on this meal. They would eat together. And they would say, okay, well, Um, Now that that's finished, and they would move on. And then the slaves, the lowly, the commoners, those people who had to work for a living, if you will, would then come in at the end, and it would all be gone. What did Paul say? Wait. Wait to eat together. Because the beauty of the church, it is a living example that when you walk in the doors of a church, when you come before the Lord together, when you gather together, there is no rich and poor. There is no white and black. There is no slave and free. There is no male and female. But everyone comes to the table together. So what are the takeaways? I'm just going to share with you mine. I'm going to allow the Spirit to work in your own heart as you're hearing this. Here are my takeaways as I've been studying this and just considering this. Even if you have an earthly advantage, because those do exist, there are people that did not have to consider becoming a slave in order to have food in their belly. There are people that could provide their own security for themselves. But even if 
you have an earthly advantage that does not give us the opportunity to treat a person as less than. And it's the responsibility. And this is ultimately what we're seeing here. This is why those rabbis says, he who is given a slave is ultimately given a master. This, this, is, this is the big takeaway. It's the responsibility of the person with the advantage to protect those who are entrusted to us. Did you feel that in, in, in this passage? When it's like slave master, the responsibility to make sure that the eye of your slave is not plucked out or their tooth is not knocked out. It's the responsibility to make sure that that, that, that that girl that was given to you as a slave is going to be treated like your daughter. It's your responsibility to protect the people that were entrusted to you, to protect the people who might not have as great of earthly advantage. And sometimes, sometimes, the person with the advantage is going to lose in order for, for the person who with lesser advantage, in order for them to live. Sometimes you're going to lose so that a person with a lesser advantage can live. As we just focus our minds towards the table, I, I, I just, I think of the phrase, come all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Our culture, this conversation of racism, this conversation of, um, of just people judging each other, it, it's heavy. It weighs heavy on my heart. I know it weighs heavy on your heart. I know we are all trying to figure out what is going on here. And I think, I not I think, the church is the place where we can all come with our heavy hearts, with, with, the, with the declaration of saying, this world is messed up and we're waiting for the next. We can come with our heavy hearts and go, what we all need, regardless of advantages or disadvantages and backgrounds and whatever else, regardless of perspectives, what we all need is Christ. Because what we can all say is, I am a sinner, unworthy of any grace, and yet Christ came and died on a cross for me. Let's pray and we can take the table together. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that... You could rock our world. You could rock our judgmentalism with the thought that there is no better than or less than. That in light of you, we are all equal. Equally in need of a savior. Equally in, 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 in need of mercy. Lord, help our church, our specific church, help our body to be salt and light to the world around us. Help the way that we interact with people. Help us to be a testimony that there is no better than or less than. Break in us our judgmentalism so that we can love those around us, both who have judgmentalism and who, who do not. Lord, help our body to be a shining example of your love, a shining example of your truth, a shining example of your gospel. In your name, amen.